All righty, everybody, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, and John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part two of the Ark. The, um, there was a number of items in the Ark, of which Aaron's rod was one of them. So we're going to read a little bit about Aaron's rod. And uh, remember, Aaron had a rod that he could do miracles with. And uh, maybe that's where these uh, Satanists and their little magic wands, maybe that's where it's a corruption of. I don't know. But another thing to think, too, is all the furniture in the tabernacle was in the shape of a cross. Now, you know, in Genesis 3, there was the tree of good and evil. And then in Revelation, the book of Revelation, there's the tree of life. I wonder if the cross is kind of a representation of the tree of life. I mean, obviously, Jesus is you know, it's in his uh, life that we have life, his blood. But I wonder if the cross was a representation of the tree of life. After all, what was the cross made out of? Wood. So, all right, well, turn your King James Bibles to Exodus chapter 4. We're going to do some reading um, in Exodus I want to study out a little bit about the uh, the rod. This might be a part two of a maybe three part series. I don't know. Sometimes I think something's going to take about thirty minutes and ends up taking an hour. Sometimes I think it take an hour and it ends up being three or four. Uh, there's just so many doctrines that interweave with each other, and I have a hard time sometimes trying to decide what to include, what to exclude, um, how much to include, you know, and, and what to leave out. I, it's just, you know, it's, it's a bit. So we're going to skip around a little bit. All right, so... All right, in Moses... Um, a little bit of background. Moses was uh, found by Pharaoh's daughters. They raised him. And then he got bigger, obviously, and he was trained. Now, when you're the daughter of the king, you better believe you're going to have a first-class education. I mean, let's face it. You're going to go uh, to Harvard. You're going to go to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, Berlin Polytechnical Institute, uh, I mean, you know, MIT, you're going to go to the best schools in the world, period. Well, the Bible records that Moses was learned in all the knowledge of the Egyptians. Now, Egypt, to my Bible knowledge, is never spoken of nicely in the Bible, absolutely never. Egypt is always spoken of in a derogatory manner. Egypt had multiple gods, multiple gods. And uh, of course, when uh, there's those that are try to make Christianity into having three gods, you know, those, oh, the Trinity, that's a false doctrine, they'll tell you. You know, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and what have you. The oneness Pentecostals. But, you know, let's face it, people. The Bible plainly teaches man has a body, man has a soul, man has a spirit, and God was made man in his image. So why can't Jesus Christ be the body the Holy Spirit is the Spirit, 
And then God the Father is a soul. Why not? Why can't, you know, why can't God be three parts yet one? You know, I'm not three people, but I have a body, a soul, and a spirit. So, but the thing is, Moses learned all the knowledge of the Egyptians. And then he saw an Egyptian mishandling a Hebrew. So what did he do? He killed him. Well, then uh, the Hebrews started gossiping and talking too much, and it got back to Pharaoh. And Moses knew that his goose, goose would have been cooked if he'd have st stuck around, so he took off. He hightailed it out of Dodge, so to speak. Uh, so then he uh, went into the desert and uh, met up with some girls that were being harassed. They were like shepherd girls. They were being harassed by, I think they were Midianites. I'm not sure. Uh, but he he drove the uh, the ones that were giving the girls a hard time. He drove them away. Uh, you better believe a son of the Pharaoh's daughter is going to be taught how to fight. I mean, that's just the way it is, you know. But uh, so then they brought him her. They uh, the girls brought Pharaoh. I mean, uh, Moses home. Uh, the guy gave uh, Moses one of his daughters for a wife. And uh, here's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Exodus chapter 4. Now, Moses is watching the flock, and he's out in the desert, and he sees the burning bush. Okay, and that's where we are in this story. Uh, then the Lord starts speaking to Moses. Moses was to be a deliverer of the people, to bring them out of Egypt. And hopefully you've read Genesis and Exodus and the whole Bible. I mean, let's face it, you're doing yourself an extreme disfavor by uh, not having read the entire Bible. You know, you could read the New Testament or parts of it or maybe none of it, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But if you want a deeper understanding, you got to read the whole Bible. That's just the way it is. Um, you know, I honestly can say I've only read the entire Bible one time in its entirety that I can remember. But I have listened to it on audio a numerous times numerous times and I've read individual things but to go from cover to cover um, one time that I can remember but I think everybody should do that at least once uh, there's somebody that says if you read uh, three chapters of the Bible every day in one year you will have gone through the entire Bible three chapters every day uh, you're talking maybe, I, I don't know, I'm a fast reader. But I, I think 15 to 20 minutes, most people could read uh, three chapters. So, Pastor Dan Gaiman of the Church of Israel in Shell City, Missouri, um, he used to read the Bible every year. He'd go through it every year. But, you know, he's doing Bible studies I tell you what, get on his mailing list. He's probably forgotten more than I'll ever know. And if you like what I teach, you'll love what he teaches because he probably taught me 85% of everything that I know. All right, Exodus uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. Uh, so the Lord, he's talking to the Lord here. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto me. So here it is, the Lord appeared unto Moses and, and is talking to him and telling him, all right, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to uh, get my people out of there. Well, that's the Bob paraphrase. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto him, 
what is that in thine hand? <laughs> you know, like the Lord doesn't know, you know, like the Lord doesn't know the answer to that question. Hey, what's that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Yeah, I think I'd be pretty uh, weirded out if that happened to me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. You know, when I first came to the Lord, that's who I prayed to. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. There is no way to be misunderstood. Absolutely not. You can, no way. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob hath appeared unto thee. Verse 6. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom, and he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Now, I don't know. We don't really know about leprosy. You want to know about leprosy, go to India. Go to Haiti. And we got... We probably got 100,000 Haitians here in South Florida. Uh, there used to be only like three or four dozen cases of leprosy in the entire United States until we started letting the Haitians into our country. Now there was more cases in just Miami-Dade County alone than the entire rest of the United States. Leprosy is a horrible disease. Your skin turns paper white. And your, if if it's on your toe, uh, thing, uh, if it's on your foot, your toes will fall off. If it's on your hands, your fingers will fall off. That's how bad that stuff is. It's nasty. And that was one of the things that the Bible said to quarantine. If somebody had it, leprosy. You quarantined them. You kicked them out of the camp. Oh yeah. So Moses stuck his hand in brought it out it was like leprosy he put it back in brought it out it was pink again verse 8 and it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee neither hearken to the voice of the first sign that they will believe the voice of the latter sign you know this is a thing israel sort of kind of believed moses and his signs but they didn't want to believe the, the many, many, many signs that Jesus did. I, I don't recall Moses ever raising somebody up from the dead or, or healing the blind. But they believed Moses, but they wouldn't believe Christ. Christ gave them so many different signs, they didn't know what to do with them all. Oh, we got to kill him so that, you know, to stop people from believing on him because he keeps doing all these miracles. We got to get rid of this guy. He's messing up our uh, our uh, money changing tables here in the temple. Yeah. Verse 9. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Now, here's the thing. When you look at the plagues of Egypt, every plague of Egypt was a challenge to the gods of Egypt. Egypt had a water god, the sky god, uh, they had all these different gods. Every single plague was a challenge to one of the gods of Egypt. And guess what? 
Oh, and the Plague of Darkness? That was Ra, the sun god. But uh, the plagues of Revelation mimic, in some ways, the plagues of Egypt. So, all right, so God says, I'm going to be with you, Moses, and I'm going to show you, you know, I'm going to do miracles so that they'll believe you. What did, answer, what did Moses answer? Verse 10, And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto my, thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Oh, Lord, you know I don't know how to talk very well. Uh, reminds me of, uh, I used to love that cartoon, uh, Looney Tunes. You had Speedy Gonzalez, and then you had his, you had his cousin, Slowpoke Rodriguez. Yeah. Well, Lord, you know I'm not very good at speaking. And I'm kind of slow to talk, you know. And no, I'm not trying to make fun of the Mexicans, but that was funny. I used to love, I used to love Slowpoke Rodriguez. So, you know, here it is. The Lord's trying to get Moses to do his job. And Moses is like, eh, I don't really want to, you know. I don't know how to talk, you know. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Yeah, Moses, you know, I made your mouth, I made your eyes, I made your tongue. You're going to tell me I don't know what I'm doing? Uh, that's kind of the Bob commentary there. So, verse 11, now, there, now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. You see, the Lord already made plans because he knew Moses wasn't going to be wanting to do this job for him. So he already uh, had uh, sent Aaron on his way to meet him. All right, verse 15. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what ye shall do. So here it is. Uh, God's going to speak to Moses. Moses is going to speak with Aaron. Well, God's going to speak to both of them. But Aaron's going to be the mouthpiece. And, uh, and then uh, they're going to be told what to do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. So this rod is going to be, you know, it's going to do signs and wonders. It's going to do miracles. And, uh, you know, Harry Potter, right? Magic wand, that's what they want you to believe. You know, there's actually people that believe and teach that uh, Moses and Jesus were just master magicians that knew magic really well. Yeah, there's people that teach that garbage. Yeah. Uh, to me, that seems the unpardonable sin. To me. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Verse 18, And Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said unto him, Let me go, I pray thee, and return unto my brethren, which are in Egypt, to see whether they be yet alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said unto Moses in Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought thy life. 
And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass. And he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God, the rod of God, in his hand. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart, that he will not, that he shall not let the people go. Very important. You know what? When the Lord hardens your heart, you got a problem. Big problem. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. All right. Let's go to chapter 7. Ah, let's keep reading. All right. Uh, Exodus 4, 24. And it came to pass, by the way, in the inn, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Now, why is this? Well, because I guess Moses had not circumcised his sons. Uh, so the Lord's angry, and he's getting ready to kill Moses. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone. Um, I don't know if you know it, but... Uh, there's a type of volcanic rock. Oh, I need to look it up. Obsidian, yeah, obsidian. Uh, it's uh, when the uh, it when it breaks, it can break at sharp edges, and uh, it was used for cutting tools. Very, very sharp. I mean, it was. Uh, even used as scalpels for a while. Uh, so, you, you know, that stuff's sharp. Uh, I don't know if that's what she had and used, but, you know. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. And the Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Now, I find it funny that uh, they wanted to kill all the, um, the male children and Moses escaped. And then Aaron, where did Aaron come from? I guess they didn't cast him into the river either. You know, the, I don't... I don't know where the, uh, the story about Aaron is. You know, you got the story about Moses putting put in an, into an ark of bulrushes and being spared. But what about Aaron? I, I don't know. Uh, and Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the uh, signs in the sight of the people. So, all the miracles, right? And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel that, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Boy, that's not going to last long, huh? All right, so, chapter 7. All right, let's do chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh. And Aaron, thy brother, shall be thy prophet. Um, the Bible records that in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The Bible says that. That's why there's the two witnesses that confront the uh, beast and the false prophet. Um, so keep that in mind. 
thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh that he sent the children of Israel out of his land. Uh, oh, okay, so I guess Aaron is older than Moses, so Aaron probably was born before Pharaoh's decree to uh, cast all the, the men children in the Nile River. All right, verse 3, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not hearken unto you. He, no, he won't listen. That I may lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth mine armies. See, Israel was considered his armies. And bring forth mine armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am am the Lord when I stretch forth mine hand upon Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded them, so did they. And Moses was fourscore years old and Aaron fourscore and three years old when they spoke, spake unto Pharaoh. So Aaron was born three years before Moses. So probably before the decree of Pharaoh to kill all the male children. So uh, people say, oh, that was horribly cruel of the Lord to kill all the firstborn in Egypt. Well, how many children were murdered in, Hebrew children were murdered in Egypt because of Pharaoh's decree? Huh? Uh, you can call it karma. You can call it payback. You can call it whatever you want. But uh, the Bible calls it judgment, righteous judgment. Verse 8, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh and they did so as the Lord had commanded, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his serv servants, and it became a serpent. And then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Oh yeah, he called his witchcraft people. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. And they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Uh, maybe it was a king cobra. You know why they call it a king cobra? Because it's the king of snakes. King cobras are snake eaters. Uh, they don't care. They eat snakes. The bigger, the better. That's just my guess. I don't know. That's why they call it the king. Those blasted things can get uh, up to like uh, like six meters long or about 18 feet. It can raise up, look a man straight in the eye, and two-thirds of the snake is still on the ground. Them things it can get big. Be glad, uh, yeah. Yeah, when you when they see a a two hundred pound uh, Burmese python, they're like, "Ooh, dinner time, dog! Dinner time!" Yeah, they eat them things. Verse thirteen. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them, and the Lord had said, and the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened; he refuseth to let the people go. Um, get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goeth out unto the water, and thou shalt stand by the river's brink against he come. And the rod which was turned into a serpent shalt thou take in thine hand, and thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath sent me unto thee, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, hitherto thou wouldest not hear. Thus saith the Lord, In this Thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod 
that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and that they may be turned to blood. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. Now, the, uh, the Egyptians had a water god. I don't remember the name. Um, you know, I've studied this stuff, but it's been a long time. So maybe it's Alzheimer's setting in. I don't know. And the Lord spake unto Moses, say, to, say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, take thy rod, and stretch up thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. See, the Egyptians had shed much blood of the Hebrew children, so the Lord's giving them blood to drink. All right, where do we see something like that in the book of, uh, uh, let's see, the, the plagues of Revelation? How about Revelation chapter 16, verse 1? And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials, the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Now, uh... Real quick, I'll mention this. The um, microchips that uh, that they're making for uh, animals that might possibly be the mark of the beast, guess what they're using for a power pack? Lithium. You ever heard of lithium batteries? Yeah, well, when I was doing photography, that's what I would buy is lithium batteries because they would last a long time. Um but lithium, when it gets under your skin, if there's a leak, causes a very grievous sore. So I'm not saying this that's a prophecy. I'm not saying, but it would line up with uh, Scripture. All right, verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Isn't that just like what we're reading in Exodus? Oh, yeah. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Oh, yeah. So, back to Exodus. Um... Uh, all right, so, let's see... Exodus 7, 18, And the fish that was in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying to Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out uh, thine hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod, the rod, and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that was in the river died, and the river stank, and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river, and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. Okay, so just because, well, so the Lord turns the water to where you can't drink it, and then your magicians do the same thing? Why didn't 
Pharaoh's magicians turned the water from blood to water because they couldn't. All they could do was mimic the Lord's hand. That's it. All right. All right, let's go to Exodus chapter 14. I, um, I feel like I'm beating this rod thing to death, but uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I kind of consider it important. Exodus 14, 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and camp before uh, Pihaharoth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, before ye shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh, all right, so here it is, um, Moses and Israel had left Egypt. And then Pharaoh had a change of heart after Israel left, and, and basically he's like, what in the world did I do? You know, we all our slaves left. I mean, we're going to have to do our own work now. Why don't we grab the army and go go chase them down and bring them back? You know, that's that's the that's the the Bob translation. Um, verse three: For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land; the wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants were turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped, camping by the sea besides uh, Pihahiroth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. For Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Why criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift up, but lift thou up thy rod. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will, get the, uh, I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And if you don't know the rest of the story, uh, Israel crossed over the Red Sea, to the other side on from you know crossing over with dry land their sandals didn't even get wet and what happened to pharaoh's army uh they drowned oh yeah because the wall of water on the right and on the left uh the divided waters decided to become one again so yeah 
All right, let's go to verse uh, chapter 17. I mean, Exodus chapter 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore, the people did chide with Moses. In other words, they were giving him a hard time. And said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? I mean, come on, people. You think the Lord, uh, the, the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob doesn't know that you need water? And you're going to argue with Moses and give him a hard time? Hey, Moses, give us some water. I mean, really? Instead of getting on their face and, and uh, asking the Lord for, uh, you, know, what, what he, what, you know, what they need. And the Lord knows what we need long before we know what we need. Okay? But, uh, I mean, let's face it. Uh, he's trying, he took them out of Egypt. Now he's trying to take Egypt out of them. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. Oh, yeah. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, the rock. I did a Bible study on the rock, if memory serves me correctly. And thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of that place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Uh, if you don't know who Amalek is, he was a grandson of Esau. Yeah. You know, Esau that married the uh, Hittite Canaanite woman? Oh, yeah. And uh, every time somebody tells you, oh, well, you know, whosoever will, when they call upon the Lord, they're going to get saved. Well, let's take a look at Amalek. If you think anybody could be saved, I suggest you read Exodus chapter 17 and verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Uh, war with Amalek from generation to generation? Oh, Ch Chaplain Bob, but you're wrong. But now Jesus came and he just loves everybody and he wants Amalek to get saved. Well, evidently you don't know who the Canaanites were. May I suggest you read Genesis chapter 6. And if you don't know who the sons of God are, look at Job 38, where they shouted for joy at the creation or the foundation of the earth. They couldn't have been humans because Adam didn't come until six days after the earth was created. I mean, the fallen angels, people... You know, these the Amalek was from Esau marrying 
a fallen angel human hybrid. God said he's going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Does that sound like, well, you know, until Jesus comes, then, then they can get saved? No, doesn't say that, people. Doesn't say that. All right, let's go to Numbers chapter 17, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod, a rod, according to the house of their fathers, of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, write thou every man's name upon his rod. Twelve rods for the twelve tribes of Israel, right? And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of, of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. And I will make to cease from him, uh, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. And Moses spake upon the children of Israel, and every one of them, uh, every one of their princes, gave him a rod apiece. For each prince, one, according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds." I don't get the almonds. I have no idea. If somebody knows why almonds, please let me know because I'd be interested. I have no idea. Why almonds? Why not walnuts or Brazil nuts or cashews? I, I don't know. Verse 9, And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel. And they look and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. And the Moses did so, and Moses did so as the Lord commanded him, and so did he. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Shall we be consumed with dying? So, out of all the tribes, Levi, the Levitical priesthood, that's what the book of Leviticus was all about, was the service of that tribe, for the tabernacle. All right, Exodus 31, verse 16. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. You know what these tables were? These were the Ten Commandments. I mean, you know. Uh, let's see. Now, those, the first tables of stone that had the commandments that were written by the finger of God, uh, the people had Aaron make the golden calf, and then Moses broke those commandments, but then he had to go back up into the mountain, and he got the second set. Uh, but why am I mentioning all this? Well, there's a reason. 
All right, let's go to Exodus 16. Uh, we're going to go read verse 15, 15 first. Uh, now remember, they're out in the middle of a desert. There's no water, but the Lord gave them water out of the rock. Now they're crying because of, they need food, right? Exodus 16, 15. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna. For they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Okay. So, Exodus 16.31 And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. And the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Hey, Bob, what does any of this got to do with it? Anything. You know, you, you talked about the rod. You're talking about manna. You're talking about the rod. What's up with that, Bob? Come on, dude. Oh. Well, guess what? Hebrews 9 tells you what's up with that. Hebrews 9, 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna. So inside the uh, Ark, there was a golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. What tables of the covenant? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. That's why I've been beating this horse to death. So, what was in the ark? Uh... The rod that budded, manna, the bread from heaven, and the Ten Commandments, the, the, the tablets of stone. But God doesn't want us to have uh, the law written in stone. He wants us to have the law, the circumcision of the heart. How about 2 Corinthians 3.3? 3? For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy, fleshy tables of the heart. The Lord wants the law written in our heart. In John chapter 6, verse 29, uh, speaking of the manna, right? Jesus answered, uh, 629, Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee that thou, that uh, what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Oh, yeah. 
But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So, what's in the, uh, the ark? The rod of Aaron that did all the miracles of, you know, in Egypt? The bread of life? Well, the manna, which was a foreshadow of Christ, which was the bread of life. And the, uh, the law. But the Lord wants us to have the law that's written in our hearts and not on tables of stone, right? And uh, what about the Sabbath? Well, I know I've beat this horse to death, but uh, in Matthew 22, in verse 36, someone had asked Jesus what was the most important commandment. It says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And hopefully we got enough sense not to live next door to a bunch of devil worshipers, right? So... Uh, so now you know why I beat the rod thing to death. And no, it's not Harry Potter's magician's uh, magic wand. But that's what they want us to believe sometimes. So, so the Ark of the Covenant, we're going to do a little bit more about that. And then we're going to do um, the Mercy Seat. And that's another interesting thing. I think uh, there were two cherubs with their wings facing each other on the mercy seat. I think one of them was Lucifer. But more on that later. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, all blessings, praise, glory, honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.